What you're about to hear is not a Dear Mr. X letter, to which I'm sure you've grown accustomed. This came from a conversation that I had, which quickly turned into a live interview with a friend of mine who lived in my neighborhood until very recently. His name was Gabriel. So today, I thought I would try telling you this story rather than reading it from the perspective of the person who lived it. Let me know if you enjoy this style and I'll do it this way every so often. If you don't like it at all, don't be shy, just let me know. So, anyway, one evening, he and I were talking when the topic of discussion meandered into the territory of the strange, a thing that is quite common when I talk to people. As the key words began to pop up, ghosts, vampires, dogmen, glitches, etc., I noticed a peculiar spark of familiarity, a passion in his eyes that told me without a doubt he himself had seen something in his time. Gabriel was a native of Costa Rica. He grew up most of his life there before emigrating to the States. When I asked him if he had ever seen anything odd, his eyes widened. Yes, I did, he said, half excited, half under his breath. Have you ever heard of Cadejos? I had not. As he spoke, I ran an image search of the Spanish word. Gabriel's eyes shifted, almost looking past me as he recounted the story of a dark night in San Jose, Costa Rica when he was only 10 years old. He lived with his mother, father, and older brother in a small suburb called Las Animas, meaning City of Lost Souls. The family home was a brand new construction on a street with only two houses that were separated by several empty lots. Gabriel's father was a metal worker, so he made sure his home was fortified with steel doors, door frames and window bars to withstand the high crime rate of the small town. The small backyard was walled in to make it less attractive to robbers, and they had a Doberman guard dog named Rambo to keep watch when the family was out and about. The dog had to be trained to only accept food from Gabriel's father because thieves in the area were known to try and feed poison to guard dogs in order to gain access to homes. In that neighborhood, there was typically an unspoken curfew for children after dark. If they were away from home and not with their parents or didn't have a ride home, they were basically to stay the night wherever they were, just to be safe. So, one night, Gabriel and his brother Miguel were over at their friend Carlos's house, who happened to live in the only other house on the street. They ended up staying until just after nightfall, but they really wanted to go home anyway. The two brothers debated with Carlos and his mother about walking home. Although both houses were extremely well lit with floodlights, there was about 75 yards of unlit dirt road and knee-high grass between them. Now, they had made the trek into darkness before but always with their mother waiting outside, keeping an eye on them. This time, she was nowhere to be seen, making the boys feel a bit more apprehensive. As their debate continues, their mother finally stepped out and began to wave at them to come home. When they saw her, the boys began on their way at a jog as the turning back to say goodnight to Carlos and his mother as they went back inside. And this is where things get weird when the boys turned back to look at their mother, she was gone. What they saw instead, standing across the street in the middle of a field, a ways up the road, was a dog. The boys slowed to a deliberate walk as their old tennis shoes scraped along the unpaved, overgrown road. They stared at the dark figure in the distance, trying to decipher it. They could tell it was a dog. No surprise, they had two but it looked far too large and imposing to be one of their Dobermans. They noticed the glimmer of a thick chain wrapped around the dog's neck. The eerie sound of metal rattling permeated the night air. For a moment, they told themselves it was just Rambo, that maybe he had broke free of his chain and got out. The brothers argued over whether or not it was Rambo as they walked steadily toward the house. The closer they got to where the mysterious dog was, the more they noticed that it seemed to be growing in size. When they finally realized that what they were looking at was not their beloved Rambo, 
the two young boys halted in their tracks. Gabriel looked up at Miguel. As we sat in my studio, Gabriel's eyes began to welt with tears. He said that despite all the trouble they'd gotten into, it was the first time he'd ever seen his big brother scared. They didn't know it at the time, but what they were saying, the thing that was watching them, was a cadejo, what you and I know as a kind of hellhound. The black dog shifted its ominous gaze between the boys and their house, looking back and forth over and over as if acknowledging that at any moment they were going to have to make a run for it. It stood as an imposing wall between them and safe haven. The boys knew that they were far too in to make it back to Carlos's house without being caught, but continuing down the road felt like certain death. Their best chance was to walk back the way they came. They slowly turned and started back when they heard their front door open. Their mother emerged from the doorway with her hand shielding her eyes from the floodlights. Throwing their fears to the wind, the brothers made the only decision that they could. They broke into a sprint, running harder than they had ever had before to save their mother. The hound's head shot toward her and it catapulted its massive body into the air, leaping at least 30 feet in one terrifying motion before violently slamming into the ground and beginning its own mad dash toward the house. The beast cut a wide path through the tall weeds of the field. The loud metallic sounding of the chains intensified as it closed in. Somehow, the boys were able to get their mother before the hound, grab hold of her and pull her inside. They slammed the door behind them and retreated inside. Their mother prayed in a state of disbelief as the front door trembled with blow after blow from the enraged monster outside. After only a few moments of excruciating terror, the noise suddenly stopped, replaced by a loud car horn blaring from outside the garage. Gabriel's father yelled at them to activate the metal-clad garage door from inside the house. Miguel hit the switch, opening the door, and was promptly scolded by his father for letting the dog outside. Gabriel and Miguel opened the front door and looked around, finding no signs of the beast. As they continued to investigate, they found poor Rambo, cowering in fear, hiding in a small crawl space under the stoop of their porch. As I wrapped my head around this intriguing story, jotting down notes on my computer as quickly as I could, Gabriel's face lit up at my clear fascination with his experience. He told me, you know what? I have another story for you. Have you ever heard of the La Llorona? I told him I did, but that's a story for another time. I went to a tribal art school in Santa Fe, New Mexico, located on the south side of the city, literally the second to last building on the edge of town. Across the road to the south was another school, a 7th to 12th grade alternative kind of school. Anyway, beyond that was nothing but open land, slight rolling hills covered in ankle-high desert scub grasses, bushes, and trees here and there. This desert plain extends as far as you can see to the mountains, about 60 miles south by Albuquerque and beyond. Anyway, my first couple of weeks in my freshman year, I was just getting settled to college life and was lucky enough to score my own room and pretty much loving it. College was awesome. Anyway, I've been a pretty big stoner since I was 14, and this didn't change much in college. It was just after midnight, and I went outside behind the student housing building to smoke a bowl and found myself alone. It was a smaller school, about 250 on-campus students, so it was not unusual to find the smoking area empty. So I'm smoking some hash on a nice bowl of bud, listening to music, you know, getting nice and stoned when I spot movement across the street. From vantage point, the road running perpendicular between my dorm building and the school across the street was on a bit of a hill, and the school beyond was lower on the other side. That is to say the roof of the building across the street was at eye level, and the movement on the roof caught my eye. There was a pale skinny person running on the roof of the damn school across the street, maybe 200 feet, 
maybe 250, away from where I was smoking. I watched this figure run the length of the building's roof and jump off, and where it leapt down, there was an exterior light that illuminated this figure. I stared for a couple of seconds, not really believing it, and noped out back to my room. This started a whole series of stuff related to the tall white figure out there. For four years, it was something I kept an eye out for. My ex-girlfriend saw on the road to school, and my roommate I eventually got had his own encounters with. I scored an RA position next semester and sold a ton of weed, so I was in a lot of gossip and stories around the campus. It was a small school, and I was somebody people talked to. I heard stories from other people. One time, I went to deliver a stash to my buddy down in the family housing on campus. During the day, mind you, and when I knocked, homie was looking through the blinds all sketchy-like. I gave him a hard time, because he knew I was coming by, and first thing he said to me was, I thought you were that white thing. That chilled me, because I talked a lot about the sketchy white figure to a lot of people, but not him. So yeah, other people have seen it too. One family had an incident that left the mother seeking counseling or some kind of psychiatric help. I know this through my job as an RA, and damn, I'm sure it was a crawler. Anyway, I apologize for my rambling story. My friends and I used to camp a lot in the El Dorado National Forest. We had a spot along the Sopiago Springs that we used to camp at a lot. One weekend, we decided to go for a three-day foraging camp. We brought in MREs in case we couldn't find anything, some guns, and some supplies to set up shelter. But that's about it. First night was chill. We cooked a bunch of crawdads and a squirrel my buddy shot drank a few beers we'd brought, and slept just fine. Next day, something felt off to me. One of my friends who was with me, and I had some really creepy experiences in this part of the forest in the past, and it felt like a bit like those. Forest was dead silent, and you felt like something was watching you. I grew up in the woods, so I know the signs of a predator, but this felt different than a bear or a mountain lion. When night fell, my friends went 200 yards or so upstream to do some stuff. I was alone in camp. The feeling got even stronger, so I built up the fire nice and big and grabbed a gun. I kept hearing faint voices from the woods in the opposite direction of where my friends went. They were low, indistinct sounds, but they were creeping me out majorly, and my buddies had taken the only two flashlights poor planning in hindsight. As I peered out into the darkness, I caught a glimpse of something moving 50 yards or so out in the trees. I snapped the rifle to my shoulder and got the scope on it. It was pretty dark, and the only light was from the fire, but I could see the outline of what I was aiming at. It looked human, but was on all fours, and its arms seemed a bit longer than they should. It stood a bit like an ape, but very low to the ground. I only saw it for a second before it loped off deeper into the woods. After I lost track of it, I'd hear light rustling in different directions around the camp. Leaves scuffling, the occasional twig breaking. Always away from where my friends went, in the 180 degrees on the other side of the camp from their departure, I got the sense that whatever it was, it was stalking me. I kept the fire high and was staying sharp looking out into the woods, but I didn't see it again. My buddies came back about 10 minutes later to find me paranoid, a wreck, glassing the tree line with the scope. I told them what happened, and they got quiet, then told me the reason they came back when they did, is they started to hear the same stuff I did over by where they were, and it spooked them. We spent the second night of our trip with a big fire and three lookouts. Nobody slept that night. In the morning, we broke camp as quick as we could and hightailed it out of there. We never camped in that spot again. This was a truly terrifying experience for me. A few years back, when I was either a sophomore or freshman in high school, 
I didn't have Wi-Fi in my household, so I would walk down a few blocks to the local library after hours and watch YouTube videos until I was all caught up with my subscriptions. Usually, I'd be there from about 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. After I was done, I'd leave and walk home. However, this night was a very different occurrence. As a very superstitious person and one who believes in the paranormal, I am susceptible to late night paranoia. On this night, I was midway through a video when I felt more than I heard this booming bark. Initially terrified, I peeked around the corner of the library entrance for the source. Nothing was in sight, and this wasn't the bark of a normal dog. All bass, no treble, and it felt different. At this point, every single dog in the neighborhood erupted into a barking fit that lasted for about five minutes. Being terrified as I was, I ran across the street and barred myself behind a door leading to an apartment. I waited there with my handy knife at the ready for 20 minutes. I had planned to wait until dawn, but I just wanted to get home. So, as I ran home, the barking of the dog seemed like it was following me. In my heart of hearts, I truly believe I had a close encounter with a hellhound. Safe to say, I paid for my own internet from this point on. This is based on my own personal experiences with the paranormal. I grew up dealing with the paranormal and evil encounters with demons, but this experience by far takes the cake. It starts off when I was still in middle school. I'm 21 now, but back then, I was around the age of 12 or 13. My younger brother is also in this story. He was still in elementary school at the time, and he's in college now when the story occurred. So now let me take you back to the day that it happened. It was a normal school day, and me and my younger brother rode the same bus to and from school. Everything was fine up until we got inside our apartment home where me, my siblings, and my mom were living. In this particular moment we had arrived home, it was only us there. Nobody else was home yet from school or work. We headed straight to our rooms like we usually did to set our things down and relax in our rooms. At some point, my younger brother wanted to play games with me, but I got angry with him and mad over something I can't really remember. After fighting, we both went our separate ways in our own rooms. I do remember particularly that I put in a movie called The Blind Side to watch on my TV setup in my room. After a few minutes into the movie, my younger brother comes into my room, pale as a sheet, and says, I just saw a dog in the bathroom. I looked at him as he was out of breath and his eyes were wide with fear. I knew in that moment he wasn't kidding around. Otherwise, he would have been laughing by then. I immediately pulled him into my room and locked the bedroom door shut. He hid in under my bed under the covers while I reached under my bed for a shoe case that I kept two Bibles in. I gave him my newer one while I held the one that was old and falling apart. For whatever reason as to why I grabbed them is beyond me. I had no idea why I needed them, but something within me just thought to grab them. While I did so, I joined my brother under the covers, and we hid for what felt like almost forever, until suddenly the locked door slammed open. It vibrated the entire apartment building, and we listened in complete and utter silence under the covers, not daring to remove them from our faces in fear of seeing whatever it was. During this time, I remember speaking to God in my mind and telling him to take over the situation we were in. I know it sounds dumb, but I didn't know what else to do in that moment. It felt like hours went by before I became brave enough to slowly lift the covers off my face. My younger brother slowly joined me and I sat up to find nothing was in the room with us. It was completely silent and nothing seemed out of place at all. We both got up and went back to back with the Bibles held out in front of us as we searched the entire house for whatever it was, but it was gone. After a while, we finally let our guards down, realizing it was gone completely. 
and I know you're probably wondering why I didn't just go look myself when my brother told me he saw it. Well, that's because the way he looked at me, with these huge eyes and being half out of breath without smiling or breaking into laughter, just kind of said it all for me. I always believed him, since we were the only two siblings who were closer to each other than anybody else in the family. We've both experienced some crazy things alone together. It's no surprise that this would happen. I'm sure you're thinking that's the end of the story, right? Well, a couple of days later, my mom wakes us all up very early in the morning because she's angry about something. Mind you, we all have no idea why she's angry. And by all, I mean me, my younger brother, and my two oldest half-siblings. Our angry mother tells us all to go into the living room, so we do. Now I forgot to tell you the setup of our living room. The front door is near the far left corner of the room. When you first enter our living room, you'll run into our TV and entertainment stand. On top of the TV is a family photo of my mom sitting in the center and each of us on either side of her. Before you enter the kitchen, there's a small half wall. On top of that half wall were individual pictures of just us kids. Now back to the reason why our mother was mad. Apparently during the night, someone had set all of our individual pictures face down and our family photo on the TV was cracked where all our necks met up. She thought that one of us had done it and wanted a confession now. We each looked at each other and I remember specifically looking at my younger brother. He looked at me and at the same time as well. He knew I wanted to tell her about the hellhound we had encountered, but he just shook his head in a no motion, so I never told her in that moment. Years after this incident, I asked my younger brother what he saw that day, and that's what he described it to me in full detail. I asked him how big it was, and he said it stood as tall as a kitchen counter. It had pointy ears that looked like horns, and its paws were bent backwards. It was facing towards the tub, and half of its body was behind the door. But when he saw it, he could hear it turning as its bones cracked to face his direction. Its eyes were a dark red, and its mouth was chipped open like a goat skull. It was drooling from the mouth, and its paw joints were bony. The minute he saw it, it tried to attack him. We both haven't forgotten about this encounter since then. We always call it the Hellhound Encounter. We definitely have experienced other scary things in the past if you're interested in knowing. I might write them down here to share them with all of you in the future. Thanks for listening. First, a little background on me. I live in Utah and I go camping a lot. I've got it pretty much down to a wrinkle. Usually, I do a bunch of research papers on the areas where I plan to camp even missing persons in the area, or unidentified remains that have been found, accidents, anything creepy of note, because I love macabre stuff like that. I was coming down from Salt Lake and wanted to visit my great-grandfather's ghost town first, which is unfortunately all on private property now, as well as check out Castle Gate Cemetery. If you don't know about the Castle Gate or Winter Quarters Mining Disasters, you should read about it. The Castle Gate Cemetery contains the remains of 171 men who died in a series of mine explosions on March 8th, 1924. It's just really eerie, seeing the same date of death on all the grave markers. It was a very small town, and almost all men of working age died that day, leaving almost every woman in town a widow. The bodies were unrecognizable, aside from bits of clothing so there aren't many names along with grave markers. Just a white cross with March 8th, 1924 inscribed on them. Anyway, my story isn't about that. My final camping destination was near Vernal, so I had to take a scenic route to get there. I really enjoyed the drive, so I started talking about it more on many trips to the Vernal area. Recently, my fiance, who we will call Colby and I, noticed some pretty sweet looking camping spots along the way. So, we decided to camp there last month. It was great, beautiful, and easy to access for my SUV. 
I prefer to camp as far away from people as possible, while still having my car nearby. So, this spot was ideal. I hadn't noticed any signs except that they were camping in the Ashley National Forest, which is weird because I always thought the Ashley Forest was closer to Flaming Gorge. It's just really big. Colby and I love camping, so we decided to take his 12-year-old son, who I will refer to as Kyle with us for the Father's Day weekend. Kyle had never been camping before. The night before we were due to leave, I could not sleep at all. I had an abnormally long anxiety attack, which was unabated by my anxiety medicine. I couldn't shake the feeling that something awful was going to happen to us if we went. I spent the morning crying and shaking, wondering if I was experiencing a legitimate gut feeling or if it was just my mental illness causing me to think irrationally. I voiced my fears as Colby also experiences anxiety and he is incredibly understanding when my mental illness gets rough. I did not want to ruin Father's Day for him and our kiddo. They were very set on going. I eventually calmed down and we arrived at our spot after about a two and a half hour drive. There were no other people around, which was fantastic. The area is home to a lot of free range cows and there happened to be a ton of them around our campsite. They kept their distance and we left them alone, but we had a plan to jump in the car if they got too close or a bull came along. The weather was perfect, there weren't too many bugs, and aside from the cow pies and a lot of cattle, I couldn't have asked for anything better. Clearly, my anxiety was just that, anxiety. We each set out to prepare for camp. The boys focused on the fire pit and gathering wood while I set up the tent and inflated the air mattress. We planned to sleep in the tent while Kyle slept in the car on a twin-sized air mattress, so he would be plenty comfortable and safe. We have a decent amount of gear, so the spot was pretty awesome once it was all finished. We even hung up a string of solar-powered lights for when it got dark. Around this time, a very large bull came along, so we had a chance to implement our emergency plan of getting in the car, just in case. He just kind of herded the cows away from our area, it was nice having the cows gone, as the sun was setting. All we still needed to do was make dinner, so I started working on that while Kyle hung out in the back of the car on his mattress, snuggling up with a blanket as he had been saying he was tired and wanted to take a nap. Colby and I went out to gather more wood, and though we didn't mention it to each other at the time, we both felt very uncomfortable. We didn't want to go far from our campsite or split up. We just had this feeling of being watched, like something was lurking behind the many bushes around us. I attributed it to a stray cow or maybe some deer. We returned to the campsite less than five minutes later. Sunset was gorgeous from what we could see in the clouds, and this was about the time that Kyle got up and wanted to wander around. I totally understand wanting to roam around and explore as a kid, so that was normal. He started walking off in one direction and his dad said, where are you going? To which Kyle responded with, places. He then turned around and walked to the tent like that's what he wanted to check out. Maybe 20 minutes later, he said he saw some eyes reflecting in the trees behind us and that he was going to go check it out. I just laughed and said, nope, besides dinner is gonna be ready in another 20 or so minutes. I thought maybe he had just seen another cow or deer, no big deal. He and his dad were on the other side of the car when I pulled dinner off the grill. I stood up to tell them that we could finally dive into a tasty tinfoil dinner of chicken, potatoes, broccoli, carrots, and garlic. Not to brag, but I make a darn fine campfire dinner. It was incredibly dark. The kind of dark that only really remote places can get before the moon rises. So we were using our flashlights pretty heavily I did a quick scan around with my flashlight, and straight ahead of me, a stone's throw away, about five or six feet off the ground, I saw a pair of eyes reflecting back, just staring at me. These were not the eyes of an animal. They couldn't have been a cow, deer, elk, bear, or a mountain lion. They were just barely reflecting, and they were very close together. They looked distinctly human, 
There's a person just staring at us in the middle of nowhere? They didn't make any noise getting there, and they did it in the dark without a light. My stomach sank, and every hair on my body stood on end. I called out and said something like, Babe, come look at this, because I was unsure of what I was actually seeing. As I partially turned to look for my fiancé, my flashlight left the eyes, and I immediately whipped it back over. The eyes were still there, just staring right at me. That's when I realized how real it was. Most animals would have bolted away after that, and a cow would have made a noise getting there. I was frozen, my eyes trying as hard as they could to see in any form of the darkness. As Colby came around the car to me, the thing stood up unnaturally and quickly, and the eyes went up to about 10 feet off the ground, still staring at me. That's it. A human is scary enough, but some 10 or 11 foot tall humanoid creature with that kind of speed is beyond terrifying. I backed up and yelled, get in the car, get in the car, and my voice was shaking, trembling. My lovely, obedient son, for the first time in his life, didn't ask questions and just hopped in the car. I threw myself in the back with him and Colby, got into the passenger seat as I had piled some bags in the driver's seat. Stupid, I know. I quickly described what I saw, and I noticed I was physically shaking. I'm not the toughest chick around, but I've been through a lot of stuff I probably shouldn't have survived. I've done solo camping trips and solo hikes, and I've never been spooked. I've been snorkeling in the ocean at night and seen eyes reflecting, or eels and stonefish within a foot or two of me, and I might shiver a bit. But that is nothing compared with the absolute terror I felt upon seeing those eyes rapidly ascend. Colby quickly moved the bags and climbed into the driver's seat, started the car, and turned on the high beams. We couldn't see anything, but we knew we needed to leave. We pulled the car right up to the tent, grabbed our machetes, and told Kyle to stay in the car no matter what. Colby covered me while I grabbed the bags of our clothes out of the tent, and I doused the fire with a few gallon jugs of water we thankfully had nearby. Needless to say, we flew out of there like a bat out of hell, leaving the tent, cooler, and dinner still steaming on the grill. The drive down the pitch dark canyon was nerve wracking. After we had all been silent for a bit, trying to make sense of the situation, Kyle asked, what color were the eyes that you saw? And I responded that they were a light bluish green. He said, that's what I saw too. I asked him how far apart the eyes looked. He said they were close together, like a human's eyes would be. I know now that human eyes reflect red, so it couldn't have been a human. Besides, I don't know many 10 foot tall people. We pulled over at a well-lit gas station when we got to the nearest town and booked a hotel room for the night. On our way there, we noticed a car following us closely. We were already unnerved. Colby slowed down a bit in case they were wanting to pass us and then we saw the red and blue lights blinding us through the mirrors. He pulled over, and an officer told us we were going about 10 miles under the speed limit. He asked us where we came from and where we were going, and we told him the truth. We knew it sounded insane. We hadn't been drinking. We didn't have anything illegal on us, but I did still have the machete next to me. Luckily, he didn't notice it, and he seemed interested in the story. He said, and I quote verbatim, it doesn't really surprise me. I've heard a lot of stories of weird stuff happening up there. He told us to have a nice night and let us go. Thanks, officer. We returned to gather our stuff in the morning, and nothing had been touched. The food was still sitting out. The chicken, the bread, the bag of garbage. Nothing was disturbed or nibbled on. Last night, I decided to do more intensive research on where we had been camping. I finally found the name of an actual canyon, Indian Canyon, and it turns out that Indian Canyon is a hot spot for paranormal activity and Bigfoot sightings. It's also very near the Skinwalker Ranch. Kyle thinks it wasn't a big deal and that we were overreacting, which is okay. I don't want him to have nightmares about it or anything, and he seems totally okay with it, aside from the fact that he was deprived of the s'mores making experience. 
Maybe it was nothing. But maybe it wasn't. I'm not taking my chances. We have promised to take him for another camping trip so he can have his s'mores thing. But we will not be visiting Indian Canyon ever, ever again.